I've released content on a number of health influencers over the years, with some being worse than others from a scientific standpoint. But I've never looked into Mr. Thomas DeLauer. I've watched several of his videos, and while he may not have a science degree, I've found several of his videos to be pretty well explained, even if they don't get into the physionic level detail. So, I decided to finally get into some of his material, and where better to start than with intermittent fasting. In this video, Thomas mentions the best ways to build muscle with intermittent fasting. Herein, he'll mention a few key concepts that I agree with, but he mentions something else that I have to admit is completely incorrect. So, let's see what those points are. All right, so what I'm gonna do with this video is I'm gonna give you breakdowns of each and everything that you should consider when it comes down to laying out your intermittent fasting muscle building plan. Okay, it's gonna be broken down into different proven points, and then by the end of this video, you'll have a collective knowledge of what you can put into actual application to get the most out of your intermittent fasting muscle building cycles. All right, so the first thing you wanna talk about is always train fasted. Okay, there are some circumstances in which you would not but I want you to train in your fasted state. This is important, and we'll talk more about how you can orient the timing in just a bit, and I want you to stick with me through the whole video, but the reason I want you to train in a fasted state is because of the catecholamines. Okay, when you are fasting, your body's under stress, which means you're producing adrenaline, you're producing epinephrine. This sounds like a bad thing because it's fight or flight, but believe it or not, this is actually somewhat muscle sparing. What happens is when you trigger that catecholamine response, like you do when you're fasting or you do when you're working out, you're triggering your body to activate hormone sensitive lipase and start burning fats for fuel. This burning of fat for fuel actually preserves some muscle. Okay, it makes it so that your body doesn't start breaking that down. It triggers the release of fatty acids to be used instead. So no matter what, unless you're trying to gain fat while building muscle, unless you're, that's your specific goal, you should still train in a fasted state. It's gonna keep you leaner and it's gonna preserve some muscle. Okay, so in this first section, he discusses why you should be training in a fasted state. He mentions that it produces catecholamines and activates the lipase enzyme, which allows for muscle sparing and fat breakdown. Technically, he's right about certain aspects, like the release of catecholamines and enhanced fat breakdown. However, his mechanisms explained likely aren't the primary drivers of the outcomes he espouses. For example, muscle sparing and fat breakdown. The far greater mechanism when exercising, even fasted, for muscle preservation is the fact that you're putting the muscle under load. Forget the catecholamines, they serve their function, but they aren't the primary driver here. Simply putting the muscle cells under load, stress, is the main factor at play. It's as simple as that. Second, he mentions fat breakdown, and he's not wrong that with exercise you might see increases in fat breakdown and the cells utilize more fat, but it's exercise dependent. For example, the statement holds true for endurance exercise like jogging, but does not hold as true for resistance training, which relies heavily on glucose levels, not fats. But there's a bigger myth here that I'd like to dispel. He doesn't outright say it, so I'm not sure if he actually believes this or not, but breaking down more fat during exercise does not translate to more fat loss overall. I realize that seems counterintuitive, but training in a fasted state when the calories are equated does not yield better fat loss. This was tested in a study that looked at that primary outcome and came to that conclusion. But let's move on. The next thing that we have to talk about is mTOR. mTOR stands for mammalian target of rapamycin. And in the gist of it, mTOR is just the anabolic signaling. What we wanna do is we wanna turn on mTOR at specific points in time. When mTOR is elevated, we're building muscle. We're activating protein synthesis. It may sound like you want mTOR on all the time, but you don't, okay? You only want mTOR on at specific times, and that's why we're gonna talk about when to time it and when to get those spikes. The rest of the time, you want your body burning fat. You want your body utilizing cells and actually using its own energy for energy. So mTOR works closely with insulin, okay? So when we spike our insulin, we have high levels of mTOR. So high levels of insulin means higher levels of mTOR, which means higher levels of muscle building. Obviously, we don't want mTOR to be elevated all the time. I'd like to interject here before he goes on because he mentions the molecule mTOR and the relationship to insulin. He's absolutely right that mTOR is closely associated with insulin. And if we experience increases in blood insulin, we'll likely experience increases in mTOR activation, which then activates protein synthesis and potential muscle growth. 
he does mention that we don't want mTOR active all the time. And here's where I begin to scratch my head because he says something else in a little bit that really blew my mind because it's remarkably incorrect. But let's continue and we'll get there. So here's the interesting thing. When you are fasting, during your fast, your insulin levels are super low. You're not building muscle during your fast. I can almost guarantee that, okay? While you're fasting, you're just maintaining. You're preserving muscle maybe, but you're not building it. So what happens is, throughout the day, your insulin sensitivity builds, meaning you're getting more and more sensitive to insulin when you do finally spike it. So when you break your fast, you're spiking your insulin big time. So what I mean by this is you're gonna wanna make sure that your workout is towards the end of your fasting period. So if you allocate your workout to the end of your fasting period, you get to capitalize on an insulin spike in two ways. You're insulin sensitive after a workout, but then you're also insulin sensitive at the end of a fast. So you're double insulin sensitive, which means that when you do consume your protein, you do consume food, you're going to get a big spike in insulin, which means you're going to get a bigger spike in mTOR, which means you're gonna get more protein synthesis at that very minute. And that's exactly what we want, specific timing. So that means, when we spike our insulin with a small amount of carbohydrates or a small amount of protein, or a good amount of protein, I should say, you get the insulin spike, which means the cells become more receptive to the nutrients that are coming in. Now, of course, that's a benefit because we get more nutrient absorption at that point in time, but of course, we get the activation of mTOR. We get the actual anabolic, metabolic signaling that tells your body to flip the switch and start building muscle. And this has been proven in a study that was published in the journal Nutrients. They found that an increase in insulin correlated with an increase in mammalian target of rapamycin. So, specifically in metabolic tissues too. So we're talking like skeletal muscle and stuff like that. Okay, the big picture here is that because we're fasted, we're more insulin sensitive and therefore the insulin will have a stronger effect size on mTOR activation. Again, he's not wrong here. You would see greater insulin response in that moment, especially if you're consuming one large meal filled with carbohydrates and proteins. Yet I have to disagree in terms of it being a superior method to consuming protein multiple times throughout the day. In a study investigating this very thing, they tested the consumption of a large amount of protein one to two times a day against a smaller amount per serving, but four to five times a day. And then again with a really small amount, 10 times a day. And they found that four to five times a day with a moderate dose of protein was superior to the other two methods for stimulating muscle protein synthesis. So he's wrong here. Now, the final discussion point here. What specific foods should you use to break your fast? Well, it's pretty simple, to be honest. We want to focus on foods that are going to increase mTOR, which are pretty basic, to be honest. Protein, lean protein, specifically leucine, the amino acid leucine, or essential amino acids, those are going to spike your overall mTOR levels. That's what we want. Okay, we want a spike in insulin, we want a spike in mTOR, we want a spike in mTOR from insulin, but we also want a spike in mTOR from other pathways too. We wanna to do everything we can to get this big spike in mTOR at one specific time because we don't wanna elevate it the rest of the time. If it's elevated the rest of the time, you're building fat, you're growing tumors, you're doing all kinds of stuff. We wanna elevate it at specific periods of time. Here, again, I largely agree. If you want to stimulate mTOR and even more importantly, stimulate muscle protein synthesis, you'll want to focus on leucine-rich protein sources along with other other amino acids, but especially leucine, because it is the most potent stimulator of mTOR. Now, he also sneaks in another comment that, as I mentioned earlier, boggled my mind. He mentions you want a single spike of mTOR, and as we discussed, that's not the case on a muscle building front. But he also mentions that you don't want to keep stimulating mTOR because of you'll build fat and grow tumors. That's quite a statement. Unfortunately, it's also not true, or at least it's not true without proper context. If your cells are in a growth state, then yes, mTOR will be active. And yes, you may put on fat, but that's not necessarily mTOR that is causing that, but rather overconsumption, which also activates mTOR. I would frame it more as mTOR doing its job and fat gain coming from overconsumption, be it in one gigantic meal or five meals. The real culprit is intaking too much. 
The second point is about cancer. And again, this requires some serious context. The notion that mTOR activation leads to cancer is nonsense. There are many prerequisites that are necessary for cancer growth and progression, and mTOR is heavily involved in cancer growth. But cells don't become cancerous on mTOR activity alone. They require other aspects of the cell to also be defunct. So consuming mTOR activating nutrients like protein, calories, insulin via carbohydrates does activate mTOR. But if you don't have cancer, you won't spontaneously develop cancer from eating protein, even multiple times a day, if you are, in other words, healthy. Overall, I think Thomas DeLauer gets carried away with the mechanisms, which is something I see often with people who get caught up in the excitement of shock value. I don't know if that's what's happening here, but we have to prove these claims through human trials before we look to mechanisms for why the results are the way that they are. As we saw, the claim sounded true when looking at the microscopic mechanisms within the cells like insulin, mTOR, lipoprotein lipase, and so on but the studies taking a macroscopic look show the reality of the situation. So in my opinion, not Thomas DeLauer's finest showing, but he does have some nuggets of correct information here. If you're interested in more on my Spotlight series, fact-checking other influencers, you can click here, or if you want more on Thomas DeLauer, then click here, and I'll speak to you then. Bye.